Welcome to Turn the Page, the official podcast of the Syosset Public Library. From Syosset Public Library's podcast, and our guest today is my name is Lorenzo Carcaterra. I've been a professional writer since I think I was eighteen. Actually, I've written books since nineteen ninety. This uh, new one is my twelfth. I get confused because I just finished one. Yeah, twelve. <laughs> um, and uh, mostly I write thrillers and action novels and mysteries. But this one is a nonfiction book uh, called Three Dreamers. It's about my mom my Italian grandmother and my late wife, Susan, who passed away on Christmas Eve, 2013, and how each in their own unique way, um, some, um, as in the case of my grandmother, my mother unknowingly uh, led me to be, become a writer. And so I've had a long career and I've waited a long time actually to write this book. I've been lucky enough to have a long career. Uh, I used to be a writer. I, I write scripts and movies as well. I was a writer producer for Law and Order for a few years. and. Uh, Anyway, so this book means a lot to me because as I was writing it, I was talking about it with friends, it made them realize uh, or think about the women in their own lives and how they've influ influenced them. And I think that's something men don't usually do in, as a rule. And uh, I mean, they think about it, but they would just don't kind of talk about it. Right. And, yeah. And, and I think that's an important thing, which I didn't, you know, I didn't think about it when I first came up with the idea for, uh, for the book. But it, it does, it did come out of the, um, during the process of the writing, it came up quite often in conversations with other men. So I read the book very quickly and I devoured the stories. Um, they were beautiful. They made me cry. I, every uh, woman you talked about, you know, there were layers and everything was a little complicated and human and wonderful. I am actually a huge consumer of thrillers <laughs> and that type of literature as well. So uh, the funny thing for me is that I don't read many stories like this, especially lately pandemic. My, my attention is held by these outrageous, crazy things that happen in these thriller stories that one would hope would never happen in real life. But this one was almost like a meditation. It was just like a nice breath to kind of take and reflect. And I think uh, it, it's going to be a really personal read for, I think, a lot of people, especially since, I mean, it's it's sad to say a lot of people have lost dreamers in their own life this last year. So when did you start writing this book? I think I was in the middle of a, uh, one of my novels, uh, so that would be around, where are we now, 2020? I mean, this last year is a blur. I don't even know what day it is sometimes. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if 2020 actually happened sometimes. Yeah. I think uh, it was an it imagination. Was an open, <laughs> it was in 2019, and originally I was going to write it on spec, just write it. And my agent said, you know what, why don't you do an outline? I don't, as a rule, outline. I've been very lucky in my career from book one on, I think. I think I've done one outline and prior to three dreamers and but she said you know put it down on paper and and uh, you and the truth is because my outlines for books are kind of bad I, I just don't I don't know what I'm going to do until I do it so it's hard for me I mean I know like in general where how my stories in my mind are going to begin and, and stuff like that but things just kind of catch you by surprise as you're writing so anyway I did do the outline I wrote 30 pages in a day which for me was you know quite a lot and it just came, it just flowed out. She came back with some notes. And I, again, I devoted another day. It was 35 pages. And sure enough, uh, she sold it off the outline. And I'm very glad I did do the outline because um, I pretty much have followed it. I mean, the outline really broke down exactly how I wanted to do the book. So it made it very clear in my head um, how to approach it, how to write it. Because again, as you've, since you've read it, it's three very different women. I mean, you know, Nona was one thing. My mother was, uh, you know, had a, this whole tragic life. And then Susan was the uh, the only non-Italian of the three. And we had a, uh, you know, uh, and to bring her in. 
What's interesting, what I found interesting, the, the section I thought would be the easiest to write proved to be the most difficult, which was Nona. And the really? Section, yeah, the really? Section I, thought, I thought would be the most difficult proved the easiest, which was Susan. Um, and the reason I think behind the Susan thing, because it allowed me to go back to our early days and that kind of, you know, the, the early stages of friendship and romance and all of that and the laughs we had. And, and um, you know, so I knew the, the latter part when she got sick would be difficult, but Nona surprised me. I, I was really um, taken aback how hard it was. And maybe because it was broken up over seven summers um, and maybe I just wanted to do just get it was so much important to me to get her personality and that person she was across that I put maybe a little extra weight on my shoulders about it so you spent seven summers with her um right. well I was 14 and I my family's from the island of Ischia which is 18 miles off the coast of Naples beautiful island big island now it's been back then this is 1968 is 69 um Back then, uh, the only tourists were Germans, British, and, and Northern Italians. So very, I, I, I used to, many summers, I never saw an American. And luckily, I spoke the dialect because my mother never spoke English. So I knew how to speak the dialect. And so I fell in love with Iski from the, from the very, as soon as I saw it. It was one of those places, I, I got off the, uh, the boat, and I just felt like this is where I belong. This is, you know, this is where my... I just didn't feel like I'm a visitor. I felt like this was home. Right. And I still feel that way. Then I meet only heard about Nona. And all I had heard about is, you know, she wore the widow's black, which she did for every day that my grandfather, since my grandfather died. Um, but that she was a very private person. She didn't really talk much. But what I saw was the Nona that was, she was very funny. She told great stories. She was very, pri she was private in the sense that, for example, she would never ask you a personal question, but by the same token, she would not want to be asked a personal question because she always felt your business is your business and my business is my business. Very, and very respectful, by the way, I have to yeah. say very respectful. And I loved, uh, there was an anecdote in the book where somebody asked what you had for dinner that right. night. And um, yeah. I, I'm not going to give it away because it's just, it's a, it's, a segment to be, even though it's very short, to be, I think, enjoyed. But I really, really liked how she went about it. And then when you asked her about that, her answer, it was beautiful. Yeah, it was whole, you know, and I didn't know. I mean, the, the stories I found out later about her or during those summers about World War II and running the Black, you know, running to Naples every day. And this is years before, decades before the hydrofall got you there in 25 minutes. Uh, the first year I went there, the boat took 90 minutes to get to the island. So just imagine during World War II, 90 minutes to Naples, not knowing if you're going to find food or bread or milk or whatever. And then 90 minutes late at night back uh, before the curfew, the, the island was occupied by the Nazis. So before the curfew, and then you had to sneak the bread or the milk or whatever you ended up getting to your home. So, and then, you know, losing a son at night uh, in the war, he was 19. Uh, my mother lost her husband and a six month old baby in the war. So the war was very much in my mother's, my mother kept the war very much alive. Grandma just kept it as a part of my life. It's not something that uh, I'm going to talk about at length. Now, if you asked her, you know, you have to kind of, um, you know, dig around asking her, you know, say, no, no, who's that in the photo? And then a story would merge. Uh, but if you asked her, I never asked her directly about the war. Um, but there were things I noticed that she did without me, uh, having to tell me. There were only two big photos in the house uh, in those. And they were those old wooden frame photos that, you know, were popular in the 30s and 40s. So I knew one was my grandfather and one I found out later was my uncle who died in the war. But I noticed Nona always sat across from the photo of my grandfather. And uh, always, so that was almost as if they were eating dinner together, which my aunts, one of my aunts told me, which is different than say the way I raised my kids, we ate all, all ate as a family. My grandmother would feed the six kids together. And then she and my grandfather would eat alone. And that was their time together. So it was a love affair from day one to the day he died. And um, but I, so again, she sat across from the table 
and I, I wish I had put this in the book. My cousin pointed it out to me after I finished it. When she died, she was laying on the couch and she, her, she was looking up at his photo. So it was almost as if he never left, you know, that he was always a presence. In fact, he's a presence in my life. I've never met him. He died in August of 54. I was born in October 54. But he was always, and you know, he, you got a lot of free stuff because of him, because he had helped so many people. When I was a kid, I mean, he, my cousin and I would stop at his, uh, La Dolce Sosta's, his great ice cream gelato place in East Kent. And uh, early on, we went there and uh, the guy looked at me, he said, are you a carcateri? I said, yeah. He said, you related to Gabriel? He said, he's my grandfather. He gave me a free ice cream. So uh, Paolo and I walked away. I said, what is that all about? Why, why did I get a free ice cream? He said, because Nono gave him, lent him the money to open this business. And um, so I just fell in love with the people. It's a great island. It says now it's this, well, not during the pandemic, but prior to the pandemic, it was a huge tourist uh, place. And Americans now have discovered it because we, I was there in 2019 and it was packed with Americans, which, you know, it's okay, I guess. Mm. Yeah, very, uh, very different. I mean, I, I feel like when I was reading the book, it was almost like I was a party to each summer. Um, and it was just, a, it was, it was really just a great read. And, you know, you, you talk a little bit, which dovetails very well into the story of your mother, how your mother visited, but it wasn't for a long time. And there were other uh, right. stresses going on at home. So you were almost separate to them, but they were sort of like a cloud well, my, waiting my parents, to come. Yeah. 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 My parents' marriage was, I mean, I guess the word is horrible. I mean, it was an arranged marriage. They shouldn't have married. I have no idea why they right. did. Uh, I mean, I've heard different things, but none of it made any sense. There were two strangers who just met and married. And um, from day one, you know, my mother came here not speaking a word of English and for 35 years never learned a word of English. Um, so I used to get angry at that as I got older because I think she made herself a victim. You know, she she could have learned the language. She could have gotten a job. She could have helped out. But she was so dependent on my father and then on me as well. That, um, But, you know, maybe at some point, at, you know, she had been previously married, her husband died, her son died, that you get so beaten down that you just say, you know what, what good does it do for me to keep achieving or trying to get to the next level? It's just futile. And, uh, and so a lot of her stuff, if you, as you know, from the book was very negative toward me. But there were a lot of positives as well. I think most, one of the biggest positives was taking me on Sundays to those Italian movie, war movies. Usually they were war movies. And, uh, and that had a big influence on me because, you know, if you grew up in uh, New York and you watched, you know, American television, it was usually with John Wayne, who was 45 when the average GI was 19. Yeah. And, you know, and the Italians always were running or betraying or surrendering. But here, watching those movies with her and with all these other older Italian women who are always crying for the movie, you see the, the films of De Sica and, and, and Rossellini, you see the real effect of a war that it had on these people. And then afterwards, they would sit around and drink espresso and talk and tell. So for me, I always have been, um, I love to be in the company of storytellers when I was a kid, because I just love listening to great stories. And Nona was a great storyteller. And, and my mother was in her own way. Uh, a terrific storyteller. And uh, so she opened a world to me that uh, very, she was more uh, willing to talk about the war than Nona was. And so despite her, you know, I hear from, I used to hear from her sisters that my mother was this, uh, when she was young, played all these practical jokes and was the, you know, she was the, uh, uh, the clownish sister, the one always looking for the laugh. I never met that woman. Yeah. By the time I met her, she was, that part of her had been demolished, I guess. And, um, but um, I'm glad, you know, it, it made me, I'm glad I wrote it because it made my peace with her. I mean, I was angry at her for a number of years for a lot of different silly reasons now, but writing it, I'm, it, it just, you hit, it kind of hits you that, you know what, she did the best she could under the conditions that she was living in. Yeah. And when she sent you to your family in Iska, you know, it was, um, it seemed like 
almost a way, and please forgive me if I'm wrong, to help you escape what she yeah. was or what had become of her. Um, and even though you never met that woman, you met people who knew that woman. And by even though there, there's no substitute for that but she knew it was what you really really needed and it almost seems like it was like a rescue the best that she could possibly do at and, that moment yeah she did do her best and you know and keep in mind she was working in a vacuum both she and nona didn't have any we didn't have books in the house and they never read news my mother read the religious pamphlet she was very religious so you know she knew about all the saints and all of that but you know as far as reading novels or newspapers except for the italian language paper she didn't but nona read nothing as far as i know and um so they had so to tell them you wanted to be a writer to them is yeah i could might as well say i want to be an astronaut i mean they, they had no clue what that meant but it didn't prevent them from in their own way encouraging or discouraging you they just said all right this is what he wants to do let's do it i mean my grandmother for it was a very sharp, very smart businesswoman. But other than the trips to Naples for the black market, she never really, she was an island woman. She never left the island. There were certain words in Italian, which are in dialect that she would not know. And there were certain things. That she, one of my aunts married, uh, my uncle Benny was the head of the Italian paratroopers and they were based in Pisa. So when they were engaged, uh, a couple of women went up to Nona and said, what does Nancy's husband do for a living? And Nona, not knowing what a paratrooper is, said, uh, he throws himself out of planes. I, I, I don't know, I don't <laughs> yes. know why, but, but they pay him. And, and my other uncle who married her daughter, Anna, was, because they both had been, both my uncles were prisoners of war for seven years. My uncle married Anna, Uncle Neri, became uh, one of the heads of the Italian railroad. Again, someone asked Nona what he did. And, she said he rides trains, uh, <laughs> you know, he just goes back and forth on a train. And to her, that was as simple as, you know, he got a job, this is his job, he's on a train and he gets paid. And he loves my daughter, so what more do you want? Um, so they were simple, she was a simple person. So she just kept everything. Um, I think the story that it, it, it was it sets that up in the book is when somebody says, uh, uh, so and so is marrying somebody who I think is a prost. Uh, yeah, a prostitute. And my uncle, my mother, my grandmother. Sorry, my grandmother didn't know that word. She knew it, the dialect word. Right. So she said, "You know what? What's important is that she doesn't smoke." <laughs> and she went <laughs> away. Uh, and later, they turned out both were wrong that she was a Protestant. Um, and uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> But, so yeah, your so your mother was religious, but your grandmother didn't was not, like was not. not. And um, you you mentioned that she spent a lot of time outside of the church, and she expected to return to the church when she passes away. Right. But that's very interesting, especially on that island. It's very. I mean, people go to. I have a cousin who goes to mass every morning at nine a.m. And uh, a lot of the relatives do. So Nona was never part of that. She just saw it as a place where you sit down. And 10 minutes later, somebody's passing out, you got to give them money. And, uh, and so she said, you know, I'm better off. She sat in front of the church. She loved sitting in front of the church. But she just, uh, there was no, it was not anti-religion or anti, she just didn't see it as an important part of her life. Um, you know, my mother would say the rosary every day. Some of my aunts did. Nona never did. And, uh, you know, she, I mean, I, I guarantee you, she couldn't tell you the name of the Pope. And, uh, you know, which is rare. East is one of those islands that every 200 feet, there's a church. So you can't like avoid it, but she did. She just said, you know, this is not what I, uh, a lot of it I think had to do, well, not a lot, but a, a portion of it had to do, A, with her own personality, but B, because my grandfather died at a very young age. And I think she was burned by that without saying so. And, um, and, the uh, when her son died in the war the very first the car that came the very first person to bring them the flag and the remains was a priest uh, so I think these kind of symbols uh you know the military people were behind the priest but it was the priest who had all the the effects uh, his last uh, the effects of him his clothes or whatever it was that was left 
and she just so she losing this i think i think losing people affected her in a different way losing people with my mother made her more religious and i think losing people made nana pull back a bit from this is not what i want and not, yeah yeah so one of the things you talk about and it's a subject of um one uh, of i guess your first book is that uh your father was not a good person is that is is that um is that okay to say yeah you know to me he was a you know it's hard to it's given what you know about him and to me he was a good father up to a point you know he himself was a gifted storyteller so the stories about gangsters and 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 uh the mob and all of that stuff which i've written about came from him boxing uh sports were important to him but he was a very violent guy and and he did seven and a half years in prison for murder and um second degree manslaughter and he was very violent to my mother and and for many years i you know guys my who were younger than me were getting their own apartments and things like that i i felt i couldn't do that for a long time because i just felt if i left them alone one of the issues with going to east every summer which you know i was helping out my uncle. So I was making money when I was working there. They had a big tourist business. But leaving her alone for X number of weeks or months for me was great. But I always wondered for her, it left him um, under his domain, I guess, his clutches. And uh, yeah, he was very vicious to her. And, and um, but there were moments, you know, I mean, I used to, I, I used to, I was growing up thinking I will never marry. I will never marry because again, they were not unique in fighting all the time because the neighborhood was filled with couples who fought vicious. I mean, the walls were paper thin, so you knew everything that was going on. Right. Second, um, a lot of the men cheated on their wives. So again, he wasn't that, you know. That, that, that I guess was, was somewhat common that it was kind of expected almost yeah in those neighborhoods he was a gambler but a lot of the guys gambled and he was you know some it was a kind of a small time con guy and a lot of the guys were so again and he was physical with me and my mother but a lot of my friends their dad was physical with them so it was not like oh it, you know it's just me but the thing that used to bother me the most is like about 4 35 o'clock they would get into this vicious fight with plates being tossed and pots and and punches and you're in the middle of it. And then like two hours later, they're sitting at, in watching television, sharing a bowl of pretzels and you're going like, what is, is it me? I mean, what is wrong with this? Right. I mean, this is not normal. And I definitely want no part of this, you know, and until I, the East Kiss showed me the other side because my aunts and uncles were happily married. You know, none of, very few of them were well off. They were working class, but they just, seem to enjoy each other's company nobody beat each other up nobody threw a plate uh nobody punched each other the, the, my uncles weren't gambling away their salaries or anything like that uh, they were all about family and having a good time and laughing laugh, laughing and loving each other so that opened another window to me that you know maybe it doesn't have to be the way it is back there uh, yeah and your mother um that was like seems like what she wanted to show you um yeah, it was important for her, for to her, for me to go to Iskia, and uh, I mean, initially I balked at it. You know, I was fourteen. I wanted to, I wanted to hang out with my friends in New York. You know, this island I'd never heard of. Why am I going there? I don't know these people. They don't know me, and I thought they would hate me. And then, then when I'm stuck there for three, you know, you don't go for two days. We, I, they, they booked me for three and a half months. Sixty-eight dollar round trip flight, and That's again, crazy. everything, was, everything was rigged in that neighborhood. I had it, we posed, and I didn't know any of these people. We posed in front of this large banner of a club that neither, none of us belonged to, pretending that we belonged to it and get, got on the plane. But um, again, like I said, the minute I got there, not only did I make close friends that I have to this very day uh, and relatives that, you know, sadly, many of them have passed on, but I really got close to my mom's family. My aunt Frances was like a mother to me and, uh, I, I love being with her. I never left her presence without laughing. You know, she was just one of those kind of exuberant. I remember when she was on her last months of life, she was bedridden and I would spend uh, an afternoon at her house 
and she liked to watch afternoon TV and she loved Chuck Norris, Texas Ranger or Walker, Texas Ranger. And she believed it. It wasn't like it was a TV series. Oh, yes. And yeah. 20 minutes into it, she'd nudge me and she'd say, I know it looks bad for him, but he's going to work it out. That, that actually brings me to something. So you talk about um, being a fan of wrestling. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, was so. That makes me laugh because um, my the the only grandfather I knew from my paternal side was a huge fan of professional wrestling, and like um, like she like you were saying, she was he he believed that all of it that there was no choreography it was not staged andre the giant is definitely jumping on that guy's face <laughs> and you could yeah, not you could not tell him otherwise no they did believe it and you know it became theater for poor people i mean first of all it was on tv a lot yeah and second they weren't like these uh, muscle bound guys that you see today um they were average you know they were big but, and, and what they were smart about the wrestling organizations, they broke it up over ethnic lines. The Italians had their guy, the Irish guys had theirs, the Germans had theirs, the Hispanic had theirs. So everybody had somebody to root for. And, uh, and all the villains, you know, none of them came from, I remember there was a wrestler named Baron Bekel Sucluna. They would announce him from the island of Malta and he wore a cape and everyone, ooh. Turned out it was like from Syracuse or Pittsburgh or something. Uh, Bruno San Martino was from Pittsburgh. So, but all, you know, they all, we right. go to the garden. The old garden was a couple of blocks from where we lived and uh, it cost six bucks and you got a great seat and it was four hours of pure entertainment for them. And I think it was the, you know what, when you're living a, a day-to-day life where every nickel counts, you need that kind of release every once in a while. So yes, I would, you know, I'd look at them and you could see in the ring, they were missing each other by inches. and making a thud with their hands or whatever. Right. Mom, this is not real. These guys, they'd be dead if they hit each other like this with a chair and, you know. Yeah. And, and she said, no, 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 no. This is, this is real. Just pay attention. And um, so, yeah, it was a fun thing. And, you know, my, my son got into it when he was younger and I encouraged that, you know, and. Uh, so this is a question that I am, very excited to ask you, and it kind of brings us into the story of um, your wife, Susan, who is the third dreamer in right. your book. So is it's true that your son was was um, instrumental in having Dwayne The Rock Johnson be one of the oh, most yeah. 50 beautiful people? Yes, he pursued The Rock, uh, and he was right. He's, he's now a major movie star. Oh my God, I would have never guessed. I mean, I remember back in the day when he was, you know, jabroni and whatever it was that he said all the time. Um, and now I just, like, I love him, and everybody loves him. And... My son is convinced he's going to be president one day. And, uh... <laughs> yeah, he, well, I mean, I heard that that's, like, the premise of his current TV show. So. Yeah, they want him to run for president, but but yeah, Nick put, you know, Nick was very, uh, very movie conscious and very into wrestling at a very young age. And, and he never gave up. He kept saying to Susan, this guy's big mom, this guy's huge. And finally, Susan, you know, was a, started to watch, watch some of the wrestling and he is charismatic and said, well, okay. And brought Nick to the photo shoot, which for Nick was like, you know, meeting. That Elvis. sounds amazing. Yeah. And so he's, so you know, when The Rock went over to thank Susan for including him, she said, well, you don't need to thank me, you need to thank him. And he said, my man. So he hung out with Nick all day. It was like heaven. Uh, he also got Stone Cold Steve Austin into some other photo shoot and hung out with him for it. So Nick's whole plan was to Just get hang the out with all of the cool wrestlers. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So tell us about um, meeting your wife, because it kind of coincides with the the point where you decide you're going to leave home, right? Yeah, I was working at the Daily. We both were at the New York Daily News, except I was on the uh, in the uh, coal mines, and she was an editor. Uh, I was working my way up, and um, so I mean, we were. You know, I was doing these jobs. You hey, uh, copy boy, which no longer exists, sadly. Copy boy, and then movie timetable clerk. She was an editor and uh, I, I got to know her by uh, suggesting an article to her and she let me write it without assigning it. She assigned it on spec sort of, because she didn't know me, she didn't know if I could write. And so out of that grew a friendship and out of the friendship grew a uh, love. 
the, the problem with us, it wasn't a problem for us, it was a problem at the paper at the time. She was also my editor because I then got promoted. And it was also frowned upon that, um, you know, uh, reporters marry Harry, their editor. Uh, I remember Pete Hamill telling me, I know a good editor is hard to find, but God, you got to marry one. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but it, you know, it was a marriage that shouldn't have happened, but for whatever reason, it worked for a long, long time. And, uh, you know, like any long-term marriage, obviously we had our ups and downs, but it was, um, you know, like I've said many times, I, I, I miss my wife very much, but I miss my best friend even more. And um, I miss the little things. I'm at my desk now. She would, in the mornings, she read everything. She saw everything. She was just amazing in that sense. And she was a great editor on top of it, but she would leave me clippings. Uh, this might be good for a script. This might be good for a book. You might use this on something. So my desk was littered with these little cutout things. And I would put them in different folders and I've used many of them. And that I do miss. I, you know, there's still a temptation to come to my desk in the morning, you know, and not see that. Um, and uh, that was one of the good points about writing this book. It kind of, I mean, they've always been alive to me in my mind, but it, writing it, it was like they were here with me, you know? And, and uh, I mean, Susan was always my first read on all the books and the scripts. And not so much the script. She she liked to watch the scripts when they aired, but not so much the editing of them. But uh, only because she knew they would go through so many changes by the time you uh, got them on air. Yeah. But the book, she was the... Uh, uh, I re always remember when I gave her the pages that were ready to be shipped to my editor, she would have three two pencils ready. And I would always say, like, well, why do you think you need a pencil? Maybe it's really good and don't need to change a thing. She goes, I don't think so. And uh, she always made it better, and uh, that I miss as well. And uh, I mean, I've been very fortunate to have good editors throughout my career, my writing career. But uh, she was probably the best one, and uh, and her belief in me was very, was just beyond uh, beyond anything I could imagine. I didn't have the belief in me that she had. So um, you know, I guess uh, I owe a lot to her, and uh, I know I owe. Plus, she gave me two great kids, and one of whom just gave me a great grandson. Oh, congratulations! Yeah. That's awesome. Another so may, maybe another storyteller. Uh, I hope so. He's a he's a live wire. He just he's a year and four months. He was born unfortunately in December, and then the pandemic hit in March. Yeah. But now that I've had COVID in December and two vaccines, I can hang out with him. I think I hope, and uh, but if she sends me you know, a lot of video on him. And uh, yeah, it's nice. And again, you wish that, you know, my wife had been here to see him. It would have been a great moment for her, a great time. Um, and for Nona to know him. I mean, Nona loved little kids, small kids. They were always like, only uh, maybe because she had a apron full of candies. I don't know, but right. they clustered around her. And uh, and she found, she liked animals and, and kids more than anything, I think. And uh, because uh, she saw the innocence in both and whereas she saw the the uh the two sides of grown-ups like you know the good and the bad the only i don't think i i really asked why did you decide that this was the right time to write this book i think i hit the right age you know i'm 66 um it just dawned on me if i didn't do it now when was i going to do it you know and then um and my initial thought was no one would be would care, you know, and initially after Susan died, a year after Susan died, I was asked to do like a cancer memoir thing. But, you know, there's so many really good ones out there and we all know how sadly they end. And I, I just didn't want to be one of another. Right. Team. Yeah. And I couldn't, be, I couldn't do a, a better job than some of the ones I'd read. So I passed on that. Uh, the next idea was the history of a marriage from beginning to end with strengths and weaknesses and all, you know, wars and good times and bad times. And again, I, I just didn't, that didn't appeal to me either. But then this, I, I hit on this on the link between these three very special women in my life. And, um, and I said, maybe there's something here that we could play with. And luckily my agent thought so too. And thankfully the publisher did as well. And I have to say it was a pleasure to, I thought it would be a depressing book to work on, to be honest, and and it, it was not. It was uh, I was very eager to get to the computer each morning and um, you know tell their story, and I hope people respond to their story like as you seem to have. And um, 
I think we all have those kind of women in our lives. And, uh, and sometimes, you know, we always think about them. We just don't think about them in a way that uh, enough to talk about them, at, at, like to keep them alive. It was a great way to keep them alive. And I thought, you know, if nothing else, if this book doesn't sell one single copy, it'll be there for my kids to read and my grandson to read and my family to look at. And um, so in that sense, I think, I hope anyway, I've done the three ladies justice. I think so. I think it's going to have um, a very big audience. I can tell you, I know a lot of people, at least, um, well, I know a lot of people in the library who are going to love it, which as people who love books and love to recommend books, I think that the greater public is going to as well. Um, I so, hope so. That would, be, that would be a nice, I, that's the icing on the cake that it gets out to a bigger audience. Um, the, uh, the actual, uh, the, you know, you write it for yourself and you hope somebody out there says, oh, I like this and, you know, it, yeah. it helped me. If it makes them even just for a few moments or a day or two, think about somebody important in their lives that helped them. You know, everybody's helped us. That somebody's helped you get to your way and find your way. And somebody's uh, three of them helped me find my way. And, you know, we can't get anywhere without any help, especially in this time in this country when there seems to be such anger and, and, and uh, discord, which is very unsettling, especially when you're my age and, and now you have a grandson to worry about. And, uh, and yeah. I won't be around to see him, you know, in his 20s and 30s. But um, I, I think it's nice to, to pull back a little and say, you know, let's look at the, the good things. And uh, it was a nice break from my previous books where everybody you know shoots each other and, <laughs> and and somebody dies usually the bad guy thankfully dies but um so this was a nice change of pace and uh, it made me want to do some more stuff I just don't know of anybody else who's impacted my life the way these three women have maybe it'll just take some time to figure that out so um what are you working on at the moment I'm on the second draft of a novel, which will be published, I believe this time next year. Um, so my publisher and my editor were so taken with Nona Maria from Three Dreamers that they approached me and asked if I would make her a fictional character and have her solve crimes on the island of Eastman. I love it, that's awesome. So at first I said, you know, I, 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 I said, let me think about it. Because, you know, the deep, dark secret about that is there is no crime on the island of East Kip. But I said, let me play around with it. And it turned out I had a great time. My editor loves the first draft. The second draft has been a pleasure to work on. The title is, uh, they, they give it an old school title. They're going to do like an old, uh, you know how they, the, those covers from the mystery novels of the 30s were like, always most illustrated. And, yeah. So they're going to do that. And it's called Nona Marie and the Case of the Missing Bride. And um, now they want to do a series. I said, man, I mean, I mean, it was hard enough coming up with, you know, two crimes. You know, nothing happens at Iskia. I mean, the Katabaniri love being sent to Iskia because, you know, it means getting a suntan and having a, a Campari and soda all day. Um, occasionally, they'll run the uh, siren just to make a noise. Uh, but anyway, so that was their idea. And, and uh, you know, We'll see how Nona Maria, maybe this time next year, we'll be talking about Nona Maria, the detective. I was going to say, I have, I have an open invitation for you to come back and tell us all about that. And then, of course, the subsequent Netflix series. <laughs> well, yeah. Or, where you get or, to cast Nona Maria. <laughs> well, the, the Italians are ready. Uh, the Italian company called, you know, they get wind of these books before anybody seems to get wind of them. And, you know, the obvious person is Sophia Loren because she's from that area. She's from Putzwoli, which is two islands over. But, you know, we'll see. I, you know, I mean, that's thinking ahead a bit. But uh, uh, I had a great time writing Nona Maria. I'm having a great time on the second draft. She's a cool detective. She's very, she is exactly the way her personality is in the, in the, in the, the real personality. You know, she's not Miss Marple because she's, Where's the widow's black? I mean, my impression was Miss Marple drinks only tea. Right, but right. Maria drinks a lot of wine and a lot of coffee, and uh, and it was married. Miss Marple obviously was not. So uh, she just handles it. She has connections all over the island. She works with the Garabanieri, and she, in this particular book, helps solve two cases. 
That's great. Cannot wait to read that one and talk to you about it. <laughs> I hope so. They said it's going to open a whole new audience for me. I have no idea who that audience is, but let's see where we go with it. Just embrace them. <laughs> I will. If you love Nona Maria, that's all I ask. That's all I ask. Um, well, this has been a great conversation. Uh, Three Dreamers is out the end of April. A, uh, a week from today's the 20 a week from today actually the 27th so by the time this comes out it will be available on shelves go get it it's a good gift i think for mother's day it's a good read for whenever go to your library pick it up and um we can't wait to see what comes next great thank you so much i really appreciate it so once again this was jessica our guest was lorenzo carcaterra and we are going to close this chapter of Turn the Page. It's time to close this chapter of Turn the Page. Join us for the next episode.